Throughout the history of magic, Wizards has rolled out and decommissioned various forms of protection for their creatures. From regeneration to protection ability itself, Wizards has always been experimenting with ways to stop the opponent from interacting with threats. One of the most interesting histories is the evolution of Shroud into Hexproof and eventually into Ward. Today, we're going to go over what all these abilities do, why Wizards change to each of them, and why they change their mind again and why these kinds of abilities are so important in the first place. Starting off, let's go over these abilities and how they work. Shroud makes it so that no player can target the permanent with spells or abilities of any kind. On the other hand, Hexproof makes it so that your opponent can't target the permanent with spells or abilities, but you could, unlike with Shroud. Finally, Ward makes it so that whenever the permanent becomes a target of any spell or ability an opponent controls, you counter that spell unless your opponent pays the Ward cost. Now, it is worth mentioning that you can technically give these abilities things other than permanents, but only with a few specific effects. Cards like Leyline of Sanctity and Ivory Mask give you the player Hexproof or Shroud, protecting you from things like discard or burn spells. This doesn't come up nearly as much as using these abilities to protect your permanents though. Still, these abilities can basically apply to any game object that can be targeted. There aren't any cards that give this target protection to spells on the stack, but basically every other type of permanent or game object has a card that gives it one of these abilities. Shroud was first introduced in this at Legends with the card Spectral Cloak, which gave enchanted creatures Shroud, though the ability wasn't a keyword at the time. Hexproof was introduced in Magic in 2012, at which point it effectively replaced Shroud, though the ability had appeared before that point, despite not being a keyword yet, similar to Shroud itself. In Portal Three Kingdoms, a simplified version of Magic, the cards Taoist Hermit and Zhu Xi, the Mocking Sage, both had the Hexproof ability far earlier in the game's history though neither of these cards had much of an impact on the game overall. Finally, Ward was introduced in Strixhaven School of Mages. While this is when the ability as it exists today first came into existence, there were several cards with this kind of ability in the past. Diffusion Sliver had a version of this exact effect all the way back in M15. There have been quite a few cards like Icefall Regent that made spells that target them cost more to cast, which is very similar even if it does have a few notable differences. It's worth mentioning that this didn't fully replace Hexproof, as the designers do still occasionally use Hexproof. This is most common on instants that give a creature hexproof for a single turn, as these cards can be used in response to removal to save a creature. Now that we've gone over what these abilities do, we need to talk about why they exist. After all, these targeting protection abilities may seem a bit strange from a game design perspective, as they aren't particularly fun. No one likes getting beat to death with a huge hexproof creature that they can't interact with, and it's not particularly fun for the player playing the hexproof threat either. Unlike other abilities where it feels like you have a tangible advantage you can actively use, such as haste, Hexproof only stops your opponent from doing anything. It's not really a fun feeling. So why is the ability not only being printed, but something they've been printing throughout the history of the entire game? The reason is that these kinds of abilities fulfill a critical role in the game. To understand that role, we need to zoom in a bit more on the interaction between permanence and removal. If we were to take a card like Lightning Bolt and a card like Grizzly Bears, there are a few things we can notice. The most important is that Bolt can deal more damage to your opponent in one turn than Grizzly Bears can in one turn. However, since Grizzly Bear sticks around and can attack several times, it can deal 2 and then 4 and then 6 damage and so on and so forth. This leads to the very obvious realization that instants and sorceries have to have a bigger impact on the game the turn you cast them in order to be worth playing versus permanent spells. Basically, most permanents are an investment. You cast them on one turn with the assumption that you'll be able to use them for several turns after you get more value whereas instants and sorceries will only ever do what they did when you cast them. The reason this is relevant becomes more clear when we examine what happens when a player uses removal on a threat. In the case of the two cards already mentioned, when you cast Lightning Bolt on Grizzly Bear, both players lose one card. However, the player who cast Bolt only had to spend one mana, whereas the player who cast the Bear lost two. If you remove a threat the turn someone plays it, or the turn immediately after, the opponent will have gotten basically nothing and be down on tempo. It's hard to express only in words how bad this is because tempo is a concept that you have to see in action to really understand. Being up tempo in this case, by having spent less mana to answer a threat than your opponent has spent on it, allows you to just do more on your turns than your opponent did. This only gets worse when we apply this to more expensive threats. For example, let's say your opponent tapped out for a card like Ancient Brontodon, and your opponent immediately Doomblades it. They're up a total of 6 mana in that exchange. That means they cast 6 mana worth of spells, whereas you basically can't do anything. This sort of tempo blowout makes it basically impossible to play high mana value threats with cheap interaction available in the format. Of course, it's worth mentioning that none of this takes place in a vacuum. Cards like Ancient Brontodon can have a huge impact on the game if allowed to stick around. It takes several other creatures to match its size and power, so removal is pretty necessary to not lose on the spot. Still, the loss in tempo makes playing these kinds of cards very risky without them being incredibly powerful. 
This is why cards like Lyra Dawnbringer have sort of gone out of favor over time. Lyra is an incredible body for her cost, having three powerful keywords on a 5-5 for 5 mana. Despite this, these kinds of cards will only see play in standard and very particular circumstances, typically when they have good matchups in the metagame. If there are tons of decks with cards like Go for the Throat in them running around, these kinds of expensive, swingy threats that can basically win the game if you untap with them see far less, or possibly no play at all. The reason for all of this preamble is to let us get with it Wizard's frame of mind for designing more expensive threats. Any card that hits 5 mana, and in some formats even 4 mana or higher spells, have a big tempo issue. And Wizards has set out to solve this issue. For a lot of cards, Wizards has come up with two solutions. Giving the cards ways of generating value right away, or just making them better to compensate for the risk of a blowout. The most common way of making threats impactful on the turn they're played is with Enter the Battlefield effects. In a way, this is like stapling an instant or sorcery onto a creature, getting the upside of both card types for the downside, usually of costing a lot more mana than it would for either half on their own. A great example of this is a card like Siege Rhino. This is a 4-5 Rhino for 4 mana. It has Trample, letting it deal excess combat damage to defending player or Planeswalker while attacking. And when it hits the field, you gain 3 life and each opponent loses 3 life. Rhino was one of the most important cards back in its standard. And the reason for that, well, is complicated. However, for our purposes, the relevant point is that it was a threat your opponent had to deal with that had a very powerful effect as soon as it was played. Neither the draining 3 life or the 4-5 with trample alone were good enough for 4 mana, but the body is big enough that your opponent has to do something about it. However, even if they do kill Rhino right after it hits the field, you still get the ability off. It sort of hedges its own bets. If it stays around, it's amazing. If it gets killed, it's only okay. As you got to drain 3 life and force your opponent to use a removal spell that was going to be used on something eventually. This means that you can be a lot more comfortable playing this kind of card. You'll see these sorts of ETB effects on all kinds of threats, especially on those higher up the curve. From that same format, Dragonlord Artaka was a 7 mana 8 8 with Flying and Trample that dealt 5 damage however you wanted to your opponent's board with its ETB. Being a removal spell on a giant body meant that even if your opponent killed it right away, you probably got a 2 for 1 and you probably wouldn't just die literally on your opponent's next turn. There are a few other avenues Wizards have tried to make more expensive permanents worth playing. For example, cards like Realm Cloaked Giant. They've tried to make the cards more flexible by giving them more modes to use. However, most good expensive creatures will have some sort of ETB effect put on them nowadays, simply because they need to be that powerful to see play. Now that we've gone over all of the theories surrounding creature design, we can return to protection effects. You see, it's very limited in terms of design space if every creature you print over 5 mana needs an Enter the Battlefield ability in order to not be made obsolete thanks to Doomblade's effects. You could just design all removal effects be worse to compensate for this, but that would make small creatures too powerful overall. Protection effects give wizards more design space for high mana cost threats. Good example of this would be cards like Dragonlord Ojutai and Carnage Tyrant. Both creatures saw a good amount of play in their standard. Neither of these cards did anything when you played them, but you didn't have to worry about your opponent's doom blinging them as soon as they came down because that wasn't possible. You could answer them with more specific answers such as edicts, but this protection was still very relevant. This is the reason why protection effects came into existence so early into Magic's design history. From the very first sets, the problem existed with higher cost threats, so solutions needed to be invented. This led to Shroud, Wizard's first answer to the problem. This mostly worked, but it has a big issue. Players weren't playing it right. There were lots of reasons why you'd want to target your own cards with your own effects, especially with auras and equipments being in the game. Players were trying to throw these cards onto their Shroud creatures, which makes a lot of sense, because if you're going to spend mana on cards, putting something onto a creature, putting them all into the creature that's least likely to die is the best course of action. Of course, this was entirely illegal. Shroud says the creature can't be targeted by any spells or abilities, not just your opponents. Wizards tried to get players to play the keyword correctly for years, but eventually they gave up, and decided to come up with a new keyword that worked the way people wanted it to work. In comes Hexproof. This was basically just how people thought Shroud works. This meant that players were playing the cards correctly now, but it created a brand new issue and it started with a certain boggle. This was just a 1-1 with Hexproof for either a blue or green mana. While the card alone didn't do much of anything, it was easily abused by just throwing a ton of ores onto the card. This ended up being a huge problem, because it was both very strong and really frustrating to deal with. There just wasn't that much an opponent could do against the deck unless they had very specific answers, such as the aforementioned edict effects. The boggle would just get too big too quickly, and the ways to deal with the creature with auras, single target removal, had been disallowed from working. 
This has led a lot of players to very heavily disliking Hexproof, as it having basically no downside at all while having such a huge impact on the types of counterplay available was just too strong. In fact, the pure strength of these abilities ended up being a huge problem in terms of design, mostly because it stopped them from fulfilling their intended design purpose. The entire point of Hexproof, and by extension Shroud, is that they helped large creatures by being more viable by making them more playable into removal. The issue is that they just went too far. Cards with Hexproof were so good, that had to be basically all they could do. For a good example, look at cards like Carnage Tyrant and Aberritum Elemental, which are both big creatures with Hexproof that don't do too much else. The issue is that, without being able to interact with them, the only way to answer them is to throw a ton of creatures under the bus by blocking them. The main purpose of these large threats with Hexproof is to give players a way to beat control decks, who load up on single target removal spells. This is the way that Carnage Tyrant was and is still used, and control decks usually have answers to these kinds of threats anyway, thanks to all of their board wipes. This is why cards like Dragon Lord Ojitai only have Hexproof under certain conditions, namely that it's untapped. This is designed to protect Ojutai after the turn it's played so that your opponent can't remove it before you untap. That way, if you have any counter magic, you can use it to protect your Ojutai. On the other hand, if you put Hexproof on creatures that are too small, players will just go for the Boggle strategy. This leaves Hexproof and Shroud in a weird place, where they're just too good at their job to really be used in a way where they were initially designed to be used. So what we needed instead was some sort of middle ground. And that middle ground was Ward. This fulfilled basically all of the design goals of Hexproof without running into any of the pitfalls it faced. On small creatures, Ward made its removal slightly worse, but didn't completely invalidate it. Having a card like Sovialin of Sea and Sky makes your opponent's removal spells overall a little bit worse, but not completely useless. You could load up with auras and equipment, but your opponent could just pay the Ward cost to remove the threat, even if it was a higher cost overall. On the other hand, putting it on more expensive creatures allows wizards to make more expensive cards that don't do something as soon as they come in and let them have a chance to actually have an impact on the game. For example, cards like Tolarian Terror, which does have an ability to reduce its costs, can pretty confidently be played for 4 or 5 mana without much fear. The ward cost of 2 mana means that if your opponent does remove it at the point in the game, it will usually take up the entirety of their turn, meaning it's very unlikely you'll get entirely blown out. Another big upside of Ward over these other forms of protection is that it has a lot more design space. For example, each color has their own kind of Ward. White, blue, and green mostly get Ward costs that cost mana. However, black and red both have some more unique Ward costs. Red hasn't gotten too many Ward costs so far, but most of its Ward costs are life instead of mana. Black gets two types of Wards. They get the Life Pain Ward that red gets, but they also get discard-based Ward abilities wards that force your opponent to discard cards. These ward costs are interesting, not just because they're within their color identity, but because they change the dynamic around ward quite a bit. The discard costs make it so that if your opponent wants to kill your threat, they have to go minus one, which is good in some ways and bad in others. For one, it doesn't help much with the tempo issue, at least not directly. Your opponent isn't down any mana when they kill your warded creature. However, this can still often make it so that your opponent can't do anything besides remove your threat for their turn, because in the late game, when you'll be casting these kinds of threats, both players will usually be low on cards. Since the ward costs are just that, costs, if they don't have a card to pitch to the ability, they just can't cast a removal spell without it getting countered. So, while it won't always stop your opponent from removing your creatures, in some cases, it will. On the other side, forcing your opponent to pay life can get you a very different kind of tempo. This type of ability has seen play before in cards like Thunderbeak Regent and Ley Line of Combustion, which dealt damage to the opponent whenever they targeted one of your creatures with a spell. These cards were very powerful in aggressive decks, where the bit of damage your opponent would take would matter a lot more. If your opponent is at low life, the damage they take from the ward abilities or their predecessors can really matter. Plenty of games were ended by players willingly letting the damage from a Thunderbeak's trigger to not give their opponent satisfaction of killing them in combat. This gives wizards a lot of power to design interesting and powerful ward abilities that can make more expensive threats possible to deal with, but not too weak as so they can't see any play. One of the most interesting ward costs is on Sauron the Dark Lord from the Lord of the Rings crossover set. This is a 6 mana creature with the ward cost of sacrificing a legendary artifact or legendary creature. Against a lot of decks, this is as good as having hexproof but it does give your opponent an out to Sauron if they're willing to pay the price. Sauron, the Dark Lord, also doesn't have any abilities that trigger when it enters the battlefield, or anything of the sort. So it is a card that you want to untap with to get value out of. It does have an ability that triggers whenever your opponent has a spell, but the upside is fairly minimal. So your opponent can often ignore it in most formats and try to push for lethal. Overall, this mostly just goes to show how effective Ward can be in its role. 
There are other protection abilities that don't prevent targeting, though Wizards has been a bit hesitant to lean on them as they're better used more sparingly. One of the big ones is Indestructible. This ability prevents damage or destroy effects from destroying the permanent, which has a much bigger impact on the game. While it does make it immune to burn and black's removal, it also makes the creature it's on immune to all combat damage. This has such a huge impact on games that printing Indestructible on anything but the absolute most expensive creatures simply wasn't possible. There was also the protection ability itself. Protection stops whatever it's on from being damaged by, targeted by, blocked by, or enchanted or equipped by anything of the listed attribute. This has a couple of the issues that the other protection effects have had. For one, it does apply to both players, as did Shroud, which leads to players just playing the effect wrong a lot. Lots of people just forgot how the effects works and try to cast MA Dead on their Arkama Angel of Wrath before sighing and shaking their head after both cards go to the graveyard. The other issue is that, like with Indestructible, it has too much of an impact on the board for an ability that's trying to stop your opponent from removing your threats as easily. The final ability that used to be used in this role that has since been abandoned is Regenerate. What Regeneration does is make it so that, the next time a creature would die this turn, you instead tap it, remove all damage from it, and remove it from combat. The main reason Regeneration was removed was because it didn't work the way it was supposed to, at least in terms of flavor. Regeneration was supposed to be a creature that died, coming back, but this wasn't how it actually worked. It was instead a sort of a shield, protecting the creature from the next time it would be destroyed that turn. This has mostly been replaced by just giving a creature indestructible and tapping it for the turn. And this is mostly because Regeneration and Indestructible have the same outs, as they both can be eaten by an exile, removal, bounce, or edicts. In order to make things easier to process, they just remove the keyword and combine the two separate mechanics into one. The result is that we have a lot of old removal spells that say that the creature can't be regenerated, despite that not really being a thing anymore. So that's the history of Shroud, Hexproof, and Ward. This is something that you can see in a lot of magic designs where they change over the three decades of the game's history. The game has adjusted a lot to the challenges of these kinds of protection abilities. Ward is the end state of this kind of design for the most part, and it still has a ton of space to explore. In the future, we might even see more protection mechanics it introduce, but only time will tell. Alright, and that's the list. Do you have any ideas for future videos? Is there anything you think we missed? If so, let us know down in the comments below.